Okay, so what is replication? We've got a master DB, we replicate to a slave DB, we have a copy of our DB. That's always a great thing to have. Um, and we want to do this because we um, have DBs and we don't want to lose data. Um, we can also do things like high availability with this. And um, yeah, the different types of replication, the older Sloney style trigger based ones, you've got the binary one, which is the sync and async. That's what I'm going to do today. Um, you've got logical replication. That's a newer feature. I've not actually worked with that. Um, pretty cool, but works on the same basic principle. Um, but slightly differently. Um, you can do it with a pooler, something like PG Pool can do a replication for you to some extent. Um, and you can do your own homegrown select from table, insert somewhere else um, based on a trigger or whatever. Um, if you ever want to hear something interesting, talk to Malcolm about what their company did. Crazy stuff. Um, okay, so why do we want it? Data goes away. Hard drives break. Motherboards break, uh, machines get compromised, crypto lockers delete and or encrypt all your data. That has actually happened recently to one of my clients. And luckily, we had replicated data and we could restore right up until the last um, transaction. Um, so we are going to cover streaming replication. Um, wall files. Do any of you not know what a wall file is? I'm going to assume you don't. Um, so when Postgres works um, with data, it loads it into shared memory, there's a bunch of pages, and whenever you update something, it effectively writes into those pages, but it first goes and writes a, call it a binary diff, into the wall file, commits that, and we make sure that's nicely on the drive. We don't continually write to the 5 gig file um, as we update it, we put that in a wall file, and occasionally the checkpoint writer then goes on and writes the, the actual database to disk. When we get a crash, um, the files on disk differs from RAM, um, or what RAM was pre the crash, but luckily there's a wall file and your DB can chug and, uh, and uh, look at the wall files and figure out what the state of the DB should really be. This can take a couple of minutes, it actually depends on your checkpoint writer timeout. Um, and that is what's used for replication. So streaming replication is effectively taking that little binary diff and shuffling it off to another machine to go apply it on an exact binary copy. That is, the, in the async and sync case, with logical replication to actually add a little bit of extra data in the wall file, making it a bit more heavy, but they can actually um, extract the name and or the, the original query. So effectively, it instead of giving you out little binary bits, it gives you out little insert and select and update queries that you can sh uh, shuffle along, and thus you can do an update on only one table, so you can replicate per table. Um, with streaming replication, you don't replicate per table, you replicate the entire database, um, all the data, well, actually the entire cluster. So whether you've got one or 15 databases, they all get replicated. Okay. Um, so many, many, many moons ago, these wall files, they, I think they're 16 meg, um, you can actually set it up, um, they would get rotated. So you, they'll write one file of 16 meg and then go on to another one. And as those values get played into the database, they get cleaned out. And there's this nice little archive command in your, in your Postgres setup where you can tell it to copy those files somewhere. And that was um, what streaming replication was many, many years ago, 16 megs at a time, which, um, yeah, it's not great. It's better than nothing, but it, it's not ideal. Um, so the bottom process is the old, let's archive the files and copy it. Um, the new method is, as those little blocks get written, they get shuffled along. Well, actually, uh, they, get, they don't get sent, they, get, they are fetched by the, the slave. But in essence, you can look at it like a pipe pushing it down. Okay, so the difference between async and synchronous replication really boils down to um, whether the transaction waits for that bit of wall file to be shuffled down to one or more of its um, replicas um, before it returns from commit um, or not. So async, it commits, it goes on, and it assumes the other server will fetch it soon. Um, typically in our setups, uh, which is gigabit from each other, um, nice big little machines, it runs about 80 to 100 milliseconds behind it in high load conditions, and it's more or less um, perfectly in sync in low load conditions. So um, the... Uh, First thing people always say when they get to replication is high availability. I want to do synchronous replication because that'll make 
my database more available. Um, and that is not true because that will um, just give you two points of failure. If machine number two breaks, then no more transactions commit. That's an expensive lesson at, uh, at a, on a Thursday night at 11 o'clock when you get called. Um, it's, it's not a fun one. Um, it is not being available while smoking weed. I was clearly uh, inebriated when I made these slides. Um, it, it, is a, it is a fallacy to think that you get high availability. There is some work you need to do to actually make a failover happen. And there's a whole world in HA that you need to understand. Because if you, if you get a split brain condition, basically, um, you think the one DB is offline, you switch over to the other one, um, and both are partially online, you've got tra transactions going into both, you are in a world of hurt. So it is actually not that, e that simple, but... Typically what you do is you connect to your database with a PG pool or a, or a PG bouncer and once your main DB goes offline, you've got some mechanism to monitor that, you shoot that guy in the head, you switch over to the other one and you effectively just switch PG pool and or PG bouncer to point at the other system. You can either do that with IP switching or whatever, but that's how you, how do you do HA. Um, but what I'm going to do today is show you just how to set up the basics of replication. Okay, so I'm going to switch into um, my command line and start running commands. Um, first off, I just want to check who here doesn't know what Docker is? Anybody? Everybody's comfortable with Docker and understands Docker. Happy? Not? Okay. Are you you're shaking your head? Can I do just a quick cover of what it is? Okay. So what I'm going to use is I'm going to use Docker as a just a way to kind of isolate my master and my slave without needing two machines and two full installs. So what you can do with Docker is, um, Docker is like a VM but lighter weight. So it runs on your kernel, there's not a second kernel running. And you can tell Docker, there's a PG directory, you're a Postgres, you bind that direct directory into the little Docker and it thinks it's a Postgres, it thinks it's got its own little, ooh, sorry about that. Um, its own little little um, file data, but actually it lev lives on the main machine. So on my main laptop on the SSD, there will be a folder um, called temp Postgres. That will be my master. The, the database files will be in there. I will bind it into that directory on Docker, and Docker will start up and initialize that and think it's a database. Um, and a bit later on, I'll do this. I'll do a full copy on my local machine, um, a PG base backup, PG base dump, can't remember, well, see, in, uh, see it in a second, and that will serve as the replica, so we'll have a Docker, which is, I'm assuming, some Alpine Linux with a Postgres installed on it, looking at that directory, thinking it's a machine on its own, running a whole Postgres instance, looking at the data in that folder, and in, yeah, Ugh, okay, so this is not going to be happy from here on, okay, in any case, I'm going to quickly get there, but that's the basics of Docker, and I'm effectively using it like a VM. Okay, so, I'll quickly switch here. So, this command is effectively creating a new machine called DevDB, that's the name of it. It's forwarding port 5432 from inside the Docker to outside the Docker. It is creating a Postgres user called My Database. It's called creating a Postgres user password called My Database, very creative. And it's forwarding in the temp Postgres port, uh, 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 folder, Ugh, this is wrong way around, so my brain's gonna not like it. Okay, um, and we run that command, and we get a Postgres, Ugh, I first need to start my, pseudo, my local Postgres, uh, pseudo, Postgres SQL uh, ach. Ach, come on. Okay, so my local Postgres is stopped and um, just to confirm that, let's do a PSQL to my database and it's just like, oh, Dude, nothing running. Okay, so now we start this, uh, and it is partially started. Yay, Docker. Um, RM, my DB. Uh, okay. 
Uh, Docker. Docker stop dev db. Is that what I called it? Yep, stopped it. And I'm just going to RM it. So I'm deleting the the VM and okay now we're starting it and it has started wonderful it is sunshines and ra rainbows and all those wonderful things and something's wrong that is um, confusing me okay it took a second to start up my database and I am in and there is a a uh, well pretty much an empty DB um, blah, there's nothing, but we could probably do something like PG stat activity. And uh, we're the only activity, obviously. Okay, so that was the first bit, and then we are going to move along to the second bit. So you start off with initial initialized DB. I can now go and do all kinds of fun things like create databases in there, restore all my data, and put it all in there, and it'll be happily. Um, in that little folder there, it also has its own little Postgres conf file in there. Um, I am going to set this up to trust the role of replicator. Um, you have to set up a replication user and it's a specific role. Um, never, ever, ever do what I'm doing now. You never put trust in your PGHPA. That is a good way to lose your data um, or give it to the nice folks at, uh, in uh, China or Russia. Um, but um, because I am not in the mood to set all that up and because it is rather time consuming, I'm just going to do that and that's not going to work because I'm not root, but over here I am root. So we've added that and we are also going to add, sure, that is not r legible. Um, Let's see if we can maybe make it a little bit more legible. This, are this, this is the three settings you're going to need. I'll cover them in a second, if I still know what they mean. Uh, temp Postgres, Postgres SQL.conf. And you can go through these folders in more detail, but OK. Um, let's see if I can maybe zoom this a little bit. Um, you are going to set your wall level to hot standby. This actually allows your slave to do queries um, while it's in recovery mode. Um, the max wall senders allows, um, determines how many people can, how many slaves can connect in and suck data from it. And the hot standby similarly um, helps with the, the way it's set up. The wall level can't be minimal. If it's minimal, you can't replicate. There's not enough data that goes into the wall. Then there's a couple of um, levels uh, in between that effectively boils down to replication, and then there's logical, and I hope I'm not lying. It is quite possible that I am actually lying. So um, I think it's a little bit more nuanced, but that's ballpark the, the, the truth of it. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, we are also going to create a user called replicator. Um, role replication, and we are going to give it the most imaginative password of ripple pass. Um, uh, I'm clearly a uh, very creative person. Um, and that role's created. Now we only have to restart the DB, but because we're dealing with Dockers, um, it's actually easier to just stop the Docker and start the Docker. So I'm just going to tell little dev DB that it is. Um, it needs to restart, and then I'm going to start the base backup right after that. Do you, you're all comfortable with what PG base backup does? Have you ever used this? If you have not, it is a way to make a full binary copy of the directory um, your Postgres is running, um, and it does it through the, the, the port. So you don't actually have to have SSH or um, some, kind of a, some kind of a WinRM access. You can do this through uh, an external connection. Um, the... PG base backup connects to the host port, the directory we're going to out output, the user we're going to use, uh, the P, I don't know what that is, the V is I think verbose, and the X is supposed to copy the log files, but it doesn't work on this version. Um, I don't know whether they've changed the, the format, um, but yeah, we've restarted that, it's unhappy with the X. We do that, it makes a quick base backup, and it's done the ba base backup, and happiness. So now we have in temp, 
Uh, we used to have only Postgres, now we have Postgres slave as well. Magical. This is all fairly standard. This is all part of what you would typically do when you back up a database. Um, okay, but now that we've done that, we can set up in this new copied directory, which is a binary copy of the original database, we can set up Postgres um, slave, uh, the recovery.con file. This file determines a couple of things. It uh, gives you the primary connection info, so that is where it's connecting to, where do I suck my data from, so this is effectively using user replicator, repl pass, you know, all, oh goodness, sorry about that, um, and all the, the goodies to connect into the primary. It specifies a trigger file that will control um, the failover. So. Um, on that fateful day when the panic is high and the main DB is dead and you want to get this thing to be a live DB, you create that file and then the DB will go, oh, shit happened, we'll just be moving along and becoming the master. And it will from that point on become a writable DB, it'll or, uh, read write DB. Um, and the standby mode on just basically says you can query, you can do queries on it. Um, there are limitations to what you can query on it, but that's basically what it boils down to. Um, not rocket science. Um, yeah. Okay, so let me just quickly copy that. And, oh, goodness. And it's not fun copying from a presentation. Um, but I'm sure you guys will forgive me for being a bit slow on this, with this, okay, so, um, yeah, that was stupid, just copy the file name first, always fun to watch someone else copy and paste code, or, oh, well, commands, not even code, um, okay, and once we've created that, we are going to start up this little monkey, and it will be happy, um, hopefully, it won't take offense to be called a monkey. Apparently, that's a terrible thing to do. Um, okay, PG base backup. This can also be created by adding dash r to. Okay, um, okay, yeah. So in the PG base backup command, you can specify dash r, and it will automatically create the the um, the, recu the recovery file. Um, but in my case, I wanted to actually just show the file. It's a very basic file. There's a couple of more settings, but you can, you can cover that from uh, the software, uh, the, the documentation. Um, okay, so now we're going to start another Docker. This is, again, extremely basic. Um, we are doing the same thing. We're just calling it dev slave DB, massively creative again. My database, my database, because we love security. Um, we're pointing in the folder that we base backupped into this thing. So typically what would happen in a system where you don't do Docker, um, you'll be pointing um, uh, your main, oh, sorry, I'm struggling with this guy, uh, your main Postgres, uh, etc, Postgres, uh, Postgres.conf file, you'll be pointing at um, wherever you put the backup. So either you'll be restoring a backup, you'll doing a P P be doing a PG-based backup into that folder, um, or just changing it over. Um, okay, so if we hit enter, this will happily connect. The only thing that I need to specify here, in addition, is I'm doing link dev db to db. Um, and if you were to look at the details that we had here, I said, please connect to host DB, and that's just a, a, a little bit of a little bit of Docker uh, fun. Um, it'll ha kind of manage your DNS for you, so you can kind of use names inside of your your uh, little virtual machines and kind of connect them up because Docker kind of has, it's annoying. It creates new IPs, so it's it's a little bit annoying to get to that. So it provides this nice uh, naming mechanisms to do that. So we hit enter. Um, it starts up. It's happy. It says. We've reached a consistent state of recovery, and everything is more or less um, happy. Okay. However, this is the most minimal possible thing you could do. Um, there's a couple of things that can go wrong in this. If we were to um, now hit uh, the... Let's go into PSQL. Um, and we go my database 
select star from PG stat. So that replication, yeah, there we go. And there we have a guy receiving. We can actually see that he's the sent location, that's the sent location, that's the write location, that's the flush location, that's the replay location. So you, you can actually see um, where the different guys replicating from you are at. So um, this allows you to, to see how far behind they are, whether they flushed it, stuff like that. Um, you can actually run a, replica a replicating machine with a replay delay. Um, the reason you would want to do that is if someone hacks your database and says, dump table, a truncate table, um, that'll happily replicate across and you will lose the data on the rep re uh, replicated machine as well. Um, so running that sometime behind allows you to, inter uh, well, to basically break replication um, and recover to up to the point. Um, you can also, with the wall files, run something fairly far behind. You can have a base backup and just copy all the wall files for a week and then do a point in time recovery. Just interesting, uh, interest sake. Uh, fairly handy thing to have if you get hacked. Um, not that we've been hacked, but you know, dreading the day. Um, okay. Now, one of the problems with this is that if I were to write heavily to this database between the point where I did the base backup and where I started the replication. The wall files would have, it would have filled the first one and the second one and the third one and at some point it would have recycled one of those wall files and if I start the replication then the server starting up says hello give me wall file some point um, and it'll say oh my goodness that file has been removed and you cannot continue with replication. This can be solved, um, and the way we solve this is with uh, replication slots, and that is the correct way of doing replication. So I'm going to show you how to do that. Um, okay, so uh, I'm not going to replicate that because replicating br brokenness is, I think, kind of silly. So we are going to move on to replication slots, and I'm going to quickly show you that the, we need at least PG max replication slots at least at one. You can set it to three or four or whatever. Um, and you are going to create a replication slot. PG create physical replication slot, standby replication slot, it's called. And effectively what that does is as the slave sucks data off of the master, it says, uh, by the way, dude, I've got this, I'm at. And it tells the master where it's at. And then the master says, well, I'm done with me myself, I'm done with file one, but oh goodness, three or four of my slaves aren't, so I'll just keep that file around. Um, do take note that as soon as you do run this, you run the risk of filling up your hard drive if your slave goes down. Um, that has also happened, and I've also been called late at night. Uh, luckily, that was a Friday night. That was much more fun. Um, so um, these little things need to be monitored, and you can just break the replication. So it's fairly easy. You log in and you say um, delete slot or cancel slot. I can't remember the command. And it's actually probably a good idea to have that around because when you are trying to find that command because everything is down and everybody's screaming, it, Google feels slow. Um, but that's, that's the way of life, isn't it? Okay. So... Um, if we look in this, we are going to just pop in max replication slots. I'm just going to make that two um, because I'm superstitious. And I am going to quickly restart my DevDB. So now it has got two replication slots living and I am going to open my database. Um, okay. In this case, I am adding two things. I'm first creating the physical replication slot, and secondly, I'm telling my, and there you can actually see, X log position, null. Not a good thing. Um, at this point, it will not hold any files back. Until there is a value in there, it will be ignored. So if you create the slot, you start a base backup, and your system moves ahead, it'll delete the files, and you will lose them. What you can do is you can start something like uh, PG receive log, um, on that slot, it'll receive one file, it'll mark a position, you can stop it, and at that point, um, you have to continue with your replication, or else your hard drive will run out. So, typically, yeah. If you've got an extremely high speed DB, a heavy write load, it can actually be quite tricky to, to, to get um, replication set up, um, especially if you're moving the data over slow connections. Okay. The other thing we need to do is in that little friendly file um, 
in, ugh, I'm just going to stop the replication for a second and delete it. Um, Docker, uh, ugh, no, I'm not even going to delete it. Well, I, I'll, yeah, sorry. Um, I am slightly annoyed by this because I need root rights. Okay. Oh, goodness. Okay. What we're adding here is primary slot name, and we give it the slot name. So you can call this my backup server in London, my backup server in New York, um, and then you know which backup server it is. That might also be handy. Okay. So at this stage, we're just going to quickly do a sudo docker, or not sudo, goodness, I am, docker restart um, dev slave db, and at this stage, it will likely be um, set up. Um, so I'm just going to go select star from pg stat ish. I can never remember the name of that one. Is it physical? Uh, replication slots. There we go. Thank you, tab complete. And there we are. We've got one set up and we can see where it is at. And if we were to create a bunch of databases or whatnot, um, this will happen and it will replicate. And that's more or less it. Um, there is a couple of other nuances. But for the most part, um, that covers the talk, and um, I think I am fairly early. It's again why I warned people, because there is not all that much to replication. It is a surprisingly basic thing to do. And um, yeah, any questions? Yeah? Hello. Um, in the past, we've tried setting up the replication of PG Logical, and we we struggled very hard to find good documentation. Do you have any good references that you could point us to? Um, the PG Logical stuff is done by the Second Quadrant guys, um, so that would be a good place to start. They'll probably be the best reference. Um, on what version of Postgres are you? Um, at the time, we were on 9.5. Okay. So it only really came into proper being in 10. They've been kind of adding bits and pieces of it. So if you want to do full logical replication, 10 is probably going to be a, a better experience. Um, it was kind of backboarded to 9.5. So I, I'm fairly sure that will be part of your issue. Um, but it is a fairly new thing. Um, unfortunately, I've not played with it yet. I'm looking forward to playing with it at some point. Um, but just for the binary replication? Sorry? Just for the replication that you should now, not the PG logical. Um, where is the best place to get the ref is, is the official documentation a good place? Uh, I've actually, every time I've tried doing it, I've found kind of multiple sets of slideshows, and every time kind of bits from each one doesn't work. It's really slightly annoying, and that I actually never did this to give it as a talk. It was actually just as a kind of a copy for me, and then I ended up doing it as a talk at, at, the, at the Postgres, uh, the Gauteng user group. And it, it really, it, it is frustrating because the documentation is kind of open-ended. It doesn't tell you how to do it. It's just kind of says these are all the massive amount of features, and you don't really understand it. So you kind of need something that just guides you through. I'm happy to share this. This will get it up and running for you. It's unfortunately in Docker, so it's slightly annoying in that sense, but at least it tells you what to put into the files and you can replicate this with Docker on any machine. So transferring that then from a Docker environment to real environments oughtn't be that hard. I think the biggest issue is getting your main PG uh, postgres.conf file that lives in etc to look at the right directory. That's about the only catch different from Docker. That's, you know, in Docker, your your the config lives within the directory, so you kind of got this little self-contained blob as opposed to, um, yeah. But, I mean, that's, that's about it. So um, I'm happy to share that, um, all this, and it's, I mean, it's like four or five commands. It is stupid. It is silly, it's basic, and it can save your life. It has saved our lives. Um, I mean, it wasn't, Yaku, how long ago was it that we recovered data? 
two weeks, three weeks, um, and we, we saved data, uh, we, we saved a client's ass who, ass, mm, arse, um, we saved them from themselves. Um, let's disable all lo um, login, um, IP blocking, um, this is on Windows machines, let's disable all antivirus, um, yes, that's good ideas until the crypto locker comes, and then the crypto locker came, and um, ate all the data, and the data went, uh, went to data heaven, and luckily we had a nice little copy, um, which is handy, you know, working with financial data and all that. Um, thank you very much. Cool. More questions? Okay. Thank you, guys. Um, yeah. You, you can likely catch the end of the other talks, because I rushed through this. Uh, maybe a couple of minutes left.